Hello, and welcome to tonight's Writers in Conversation. Um, I'm Carol Burns, as most of you know, Head of Creative Writing here at the University of Southampton. And I'm the host for this series, which is run um, through the English Department in association with Nuffield Theatre. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I'm especially pleased to have Sheena Mackay here tonight. Um, she'll be reading from a previous book and also from a, her most recent book called Dancing on the Outskirts, a collection of stories published by Virago just a few months ago. Sheena was born in Edinburgh, um, and she told me um, the other day quite emphatically that she thinks of herself as a Scottish writer, not as well as a British writer. Um, and her writing career began after winning a prize for a poem written when she was 14. Um, she has since published at least, by the number I counted up, 17 books. Um, her novel, Dooned In, is that how you say it? Dunedin. Dunedin, I suddenly realized that was a Scottish word. <laughs> For, forgive my Americanism. Um, Dunedin won the Scottish Arts Council Book Award and two later novels were shortlisted for prestigious awards, The Orchard on Fire for the Booker and Heligoland for the Orange Prize and the Whitbread Novel Award. Sheena is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and she lives here in Southampton. And she's going to start us off with a story set in Southampton. Thank you so much, Sheena. Thank you. Lovely to be here, and thank you for your introduction, Carol. And I know there are quite a few writers here in this room, so maybe we can have a, a conversation with writers in between the readings, which would be nice. Um, I'm going to start off with reading an extract from a story, which is called The Heart of Saturday Night. And I'm not going to read the whole story because it's quite long, so I shall read part of it. And this story was actually written a few years ago. <clears throat> the Heart of Saturday Night. Over the years, Alex had developed his innate talent for being in the wrong place. So he felt no surprise when a balmy Saturday evening found him astride an ostrich on a stationary carousel on a deserted campus lawn. It was almost the end of the academic year. And for the past week or so, the streets had been alive with students trooping around in gowns and parents taking photographs. Fairground music drifted in with the smell of crushed grass, hot dogs and popcorn through his window. Half-heartedly, Alex tried to spur his ostrich into motion, but its gilded barley sugar pole was locked. Soon the carousel would be gone, like the dismantled marquees and the boys in tuxedos and the girls in their ball gowns with flowers in their hair and cleavages. Girls whose skin made Alex, who at 38 had thought of himself as young until he met his students, feel old and sallow and stubby, stubbly. Alex had not been to university himself, but on the strength of his two volumes of poetry, he had been given a resi residency in the English department here to teach a course of creative writing. The university buildings, geometric constructions of mirrored glass, stood high above the city and the docks beyond, reflecting sky, water and trees, and now a flock of parakeets flying shrilly into rest. While Alex, a large man in badly fitting shorts, sat hunched on the merry-go-round, a circus was getting underway in the municipal park. He had two tickets for the performance in his pocket, and he should have been sitting in the big top now, beside his sometime girlfriend Rosella, but she had let him down once again, with a summer cold this time. Unable to bear another evening in by himself, he had wandered along the paths which intersected the grounds and come upon this carousel left over from other people's celebrations. He had been looking forward to showing Rosella the parakeets, her namesakes, which nested in the high trees. Rosella was a crime writer whose feathered hair, when they first met, was dyed green and pink and yellow. Alex was living in the apartment reserved for visiting professors. His residency was over, 
but he had agreed to run a couple of workshops at the university's poetry summer school in order to prolong his stay. One of the reasons Alex was reluctant to leave was the visitor's book on the hall table of his apartment, in which occupants were required to write something witty or profound. A haiku was the very least that would be expected of him, but he could think of nothing which would delight or impress and so vindicate his tenure. Alex was disappointed in, in himself and guessed that the university was disappointed in him. He had hoped that this sojourn in a strange city would inspire something remarkable, but he had failed. Neither he nor his polyglot students had produced anything of merit, and he had spent a lot of time helping them to fill in forms and write letters to landlords. Every night, Alex leafed through the visitor's book, looked at the ideographs, cartoons, sketches, the fulsome limericks, bars of music, and incomprehensible mathematical, scientific, Arabic, Greek, and Latin entries, inspired by his erudite chuckling predecessors in various colored inks, and every night he closed it in despair. The main, <coughs> excuse me, the main reason, however, that he didn't want to go away was a woman named Blythe Bomeris Gridley, the American wife of Professor Mort Gridley, a philosopher and television pundit, characterized by his towering pompadour of strawberry blonde hair. How, wondered Alex, could you trust a moral philosopher with such self-regarding hair? <coughs> the Gridley son Atticus was a pupil at the Lycée in the city here, and they were waiting till his school term finished before flying to New York and thence to their house in the Hamptons. Since Alex had been introduced to Blythe by his head of department, he had often seen her cycling about the campus with her bicycle full of books, bicycle basket full of books or fresh baked cookies, and on one occasion, a speckled hen she was taking to the vet. Sometimes she braked and spoke to him or waved, calling out some greeting such as, are you coming to the bun fight at the museum? Or, will we see you at the shindig in the music factory later? The answer, had she paused to hear it, was almost invariably no. What an exciting life she leads, he thought bitterly, with all those wingdings and shindigs and bun fights. But Blythe was so like her name, so vital and interested in everything, including, it seemed, him, that Alex could not really sneer at her in his dull English way. Smart as a whip she was, rangy, with what he thought of as taffy-coloured hair and silver bracelets riding up and down her freckled arms. There was old money in the background, he imagined, and blue blood powering those strong, slender legs and sandaled feet on the pedals. She was doing a doctorate in either quilter or quilting, he wasn't sure which one she'd said, and couldn't ask now, but he liked the idea of Blythe among a heap of big, soft, multicoloured quilts. When Alex had received a rare invitation to a reception for a delegation from Taipei, he found it a dreary occasion, marked by an absence of flying buns, where people nursed paper cups of wine and bored on about departmental affairs. Like Alex, the visitors were left pretty much to their own devices and they, they were obliged to talk animatedly among themselves. Blythe, he noted, was almost alone in making a social effort. She had on a sea green dress and a necklace of silver mussel shells. Blythe saw him studying the spine of textbooks on an aluminium shelf and came over. Alex took a gulp of tepid red wine and heard himself blurt out, what's that smell? She looked alarmed, smell? I mean that perfume you're wearing, it's nice. Oh, it's just my old Florida water. I always stock up at Bigelow's. Do you go to New York? Sometimes, he mumbled. Coney Island, that's my favorite place. Blythe laughed. You know what they say, if you come from Coney Island, you always have sand in your shoes. Professor Gridley came over and steered her away. Time to go, honey, she said, and turning to Alex, asked, are you coming on to the dinner? 
I don't think so, he replied, hoping it sounded as if he had a choice. Gridley blanked him. He was wearing his academic summer garb of a cream linen suit and a silk scarf knotted like an overblown rose, matching the pink rosebud in his buttonhole. Alex felt desolate as he watched them follow the vivid Taipei contingent through the glass doors. Had there been a crint of had there been a hint of cruelty in Mort Gridley's thin, red-lipped smile at his wife? Was his grip on her elbow unnecessarily hard? Perhaps Blythe's own smile was a tad too tight, her eyes overbright. Was she compliant through fear? Or was she a willing partner in secret marital games? Alex sublimated a shameful frisson into a picture of himself landing a punch on Gridley's supercilious beak. Melancholy set in as he helped himself to another drink, ignoring the disapproving student bartender. The unspoken rule was one cup of wine per person. He had, as usual, presented himself to Blythe as a klutz. Blythe was the only person at the university who had been friendly to him. But did she really like him? Or was it just her waspish good manners which made him feel that she was interested in him and his work? She had once said that he must sign his books for her, but nothing had come of it. And he had never been invited to any shindigs or windings at the Bomerous Gridley place. He looked down at his huge trainers, klutzy clown shoes, and what did a mothball tuxedo found hanging in his bedroom cupboard and worn over a t-shirt and jeans say about his own aesthetic? The sleeves didn't reach his wrists and he hadn't shaved. He was, as his sister once pointed out, shambolic. Although women did sometimes tell him he had nice dark, nice dark eyelashes and his eyes were a lovely deep blue, even though they were small, like cornflowers, Rosella had said a long time ago. The truth was, Alex felt that if he made an effort with his clothes, people might sneer, thinking he didn't realize how ugly he was. Coney Island, she must have guessed he had never been there. It was the first place that had come into his head. Besides, obviously, Blythe Bomeris would only go to Coney Island ironically. She was hardly a boardwalk and Luna Park sort of person. Then, out of his childhood, from a favourite LP of his mother's, came romantic violins and guitars and the voices of the drifters harmonising that they still had some sand in their shoes and a ferris wheel drew a circle against the stars. On the evening when Blythe and Mort went, were at the dinner to which he had not been invited, Alex walked over to their rented house. He had looked up the address a while ago, although he still fantasised Blythe in a white antebellum mansion standing among live oaks veiled with Spanish moss. He stood at the gate of an undistinguished brick house and saw, through the front room window, a cello and three music stands in graduated sizes, the Three Bears String Trio. Then a light came on and somebody, a babysitter perhaps, drew the curtains. That night he telephoned Rosella and they arranged that she would come and stay for a weekend and she had cancelled on the morning she was supposed to arrive. So here he is, sitting on this flightless bird, with a Tom Waits song about looking for the heart of Saturday night playing in his head. Where was the heart of Saturday night? Certainly not in the student union bar, or, he suspected, in the city's clubs. He had never found it, or the bohemian quarter of this city. Could it be that he had washed up in the only port in the world without a bohemian quarter? Where were those raffish establishments down by the docks, spiced with danger, where artists, gangsters and sailors drank down the moon and the talk flowed like rum or wine, while somebody banged out sentimental tunes from a battered piano and poets had their heart and poets had their pick of the wild aristocratic girls and golden-hearted ladies of the night. 
The grass around the carousel is dry and slippery from lack of rain. The sharp leaves of bushes rustle, and in the dark, the painted eyes and nostrils of the horses widen, and their lips flare over bared teeth. Then, from the heart of somebody's Saturday night, comes a burst of music, notes that blaze for a moment in the sky before dissolving like starbursts from a firework. He remembers a time when he was backpacking in Italy. He arrived in Genoa, where he had, where he had a rendezvous with Rosella, expecting it to be like Flecker's poem, The Old Ships, and got lost, finding himself, as night fell, at a derelict fairground set in industrial wasteland. There was a waltzer which appeared to be made up of cheeky, smiling faces. But when he approached, he saw that the seats were enormous, pink, shellacked, bare bottoms. He climbed inside one of them and fell asleep. Later, he discovered that Rosella had decided to go to Rome. Thank you. <clears throat> Now, you told me that it was set in Southampton, but you didn't think it was a creative writer in Southampton. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I would have it, agreed it, to it's it. A, it's a sort of, sort of Southampton. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, thanks so much. That was great. It was especially nice to hear your um, humor come out even more strongly oh. as, as you read it. Yeah. Is that something that you're trying to it, does it just happen naturally? It's just how you see the world and then we find it funny? Or is it something you're Yes, yeah, Yes, I guess on? so. I mean, it's observation. Yeah. And then when I'm writing, I, I sort of hear it in my head. I hear the dialogue and the jokes or whatever. It makes me smile sometimes as I'm writing it. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Um, one of the things that had struck me about your stories as I was reading them is um, often they do sort of circle around quite small moments. Yes. Yeah. And is that something that particularly interests you? Yes, I think so. Particularly with the short story, you, you often, because of its length and it has to be compressed, so you often um, take a, s a small moment which can then become something much bigger. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, the particular can become the universal almost, mm -hmm. if you want. Yeah. And is that, um, is that a difference for you between writing a sh short story and writing a novel? Yes, I suppose it is. I mean, I, I think they probably start from the germ of the same thing. But sometimes I just, I don't know if you find the same. I know you write short stories. Some, sometimes you just have an, an instinct that this is going to be a short story because you feel you can say what you want to do in a short space and also s some some of my short stories have been commissioned and it's actually quite good it's rather like writing poetry because you know that you have to you, d you don't have the um the scope of the novel so you know you have to compress and compress so you can get the essence of the thing mm -hmm. does it um are your first drafts longer then i don't have first drafts as such <laughs> you're <laughs> kidding no, no, it's, p it's partly laziness. Um, <laughs> no, I try, I try to get it as right as possible the first time, which mm. is why I sometimes work quite slowly. And then I find it at every stage. But I don't actually like working on the computer, but one has to now. And so at, at each stage, I mean, you, you can read it on the screen and you miss something, like repetition of a word or something and then you print it out and you mm. see things again that you've missed so I mean there are various stages and I do go back and alter and I do think hard about it but I, I wouldn't write a whole first draft and then rewrite it mm -hmm. so is it a sentence that do you not go on to the next sentence until that first sentence is perfect or is it paragraph by paragraph or well if I'm trying to get a sentence right I then I would just I mean, occasionally I'll, I'll leave it and come back if I just can't get it right. Yeah. But I prefer to get it right. 
Oh gosh, I could never write like mm. that. I would never write sentence number two. Well, you might die, you see. And <laughs> <laughs> somebody would find it, and it wouldn't be right. And, and they then think, oh my gosh, yes, oh my gosh, it must have been her this editor. Is, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were um, talking the other day, and we had gotten together to sort of <coughs> review what we might talk about. And um, by happenstance, we talked about. Um, you had heard on Radio 4 um, Lenny Goodings talking about being a feminist writer. Yes. And I was wondering, um, do you think of yourself as a... And we were even figuring out what, what is a feminist writer exactly, but would you, do you think of yourself as one? And then you can tell, tell us what it is. Well, I, <laughs> I, I find this quite tricky because there are all sorts of people who write on feminism in a non-fiction way. But I've always just had the innate knowledge that I am a feminist. So, I mean, I think it's, in a way, it's a bit like if you're a painter and for centuries everything was seen with this well-known expression, the male gaze. Um, and it's a bit like that with being a writer. But, so yes, I would say I'm a feminist writer, but I'm not a, a polemical writer in this, but I, I hope that being a feminist just imbues everything I write. Because you're writing with the female gaze. Well, sometimes you, I think if you're a writer, possibly a painter, you can become sort of neutral. So, mm. you know, you have to inhabit a female character or a male character. So I think you're writing with the artist's gaze in a sense. Mm. So not, I mean, yes, I am a woman, so it is the female gaze, yeah. but you know, I hope, I hope that I can see the points of view of other characters. Mm -hmm. right. Well, I would agree with you in terms of what a feminist writer is. It's just sort of, um, like I thought in your novel, The Artist Widow, that moment when you suddenly realize she's an artist too. Yes. Is, is that right there <coughs> is just a, a it's, it's a feminist moment in mm. a way. And I found it really pleasing. It was really made me want to, that's what the moment in which I really wanted to read. Yeah. Re, you know, really oh, looking forward you. to finishing the novel. Yes, yeah. 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 Um, and by the way, as you all know, you're, you're all invited to ask questions. You know me, I can ask and ask and ask and ask, but um, I'll pause at some point and look around um, and see who's ready. Um, do you like, you've written so many short stories. Do you know how many you've written? Have you ever counted them up? No, I've never counted them, actually. I've, I've several collections, and some which aren't in any collections. Yeah. So. But I think I've now become more thought of as a short story writer, but I never set out to be just mm -hmm. a short story writer. I think now I probably won't write another novel, simply because it takes too long. But. Um, You'll just write 20 short stories instead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> or 40 or 60 mm -hmm. or... Do you like one form better than the other? Well, only in the sense that with a short story, the end is in sight. Um, I would hesitate now to embark on a novel because I know what it entails. And, you mm -hmm. know, it takes such a long time to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, we, we are going to hear another reading from Sheena. Does that, someone in the audience have a question before we hear the next, uh, the next like bit? Yeah. Um, I've read The Weekend in The Times. I would do it. Um, that to be a, a good writer or a great writer or whatever, you need three things. Empathy, patience, and imagination. Now, I think I've got all three except for patience. And <laughs> going back to your uh, statement about the fact that I like writing, I like black ink on paper, I find computers slow, and, and I edit it to death. And when my ideas are coming, I put it down, and I'm warming to this paper and this black ink on it, and I'm, I'm thinking, I don't want to go back <coughs> and kill it to death. So maybe my patience is not there. I don't think I'm very patient. But it's got something to do with this idea of killing it with computers and editing it. Do you feel empathy with that? Oh, empathy? Um, <laughs> I feel absolute empathy with that because back in the day when I used to do everything in longhand, I'm, 
I mean, I've still got lots of notebooks, but I tend to write something in a notebook and then um, I've always got this feeling that I've got to put it on the computer. I actually like writing with pen and ink and I like doodling and I, I like the leisure of doing that. And I think there's a correlation between the brain and the hand. So it helps you to think if, when you're writing with your, a pen. And have you got all three of those, do you think? Are you going to say no? Empathy, uh, patience? Yes, empathy, patience, patience yes, yes, all three. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you thought she might be modest. Perhaps she shouldn't be yes. modest. Perhaps not so much patience, but I hope I have the other two. But like, you have to have a certain amount of patience, don't you? I mean, it's hard work. I mean, it's hard work. It's you said writing a story. You, you can't contemplate the idea of putting all that effort and graft into a long story now. No. No? But you said well, if I had all the time in the world, I might. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, so you write a lot of short stories. Um, so uh, I imagine you have lots and lots of ideas. How do you choose which ideas worthy? of a short story? How, how do you decide mm. what to choose and what's worth? I don't know, it's a really interesting question. It, it's tricky. Um, I mean, sometimes it will be one sentence or an image, mm. and I'll just start sort of playing around with that. Or, or sometimes titles come to me, and I, mean, I have the title first, and then it's, I think it's a very nice image or something I want to use, so I will use that. But. Um, I don't know. I, th I, th I think every day one has lots of ideas, not necessarily creative, but sometimes one sticks and you actually want to write that down, or make a note of it. Um, and so you just go with your sort of gut? Yeah, yes, yes. Do you know your endings when you begin? I, sometimes I do, and sometimes I've, I have written the ending before I've done the whole body of the story. I've done the beginning and I know what I want my closing sentence to be. Mm -hmm. And in others, I haven't. M more in a novel, sometimes they sort of grow organically. As mm -hmm. as I, I've never plotted out a novel, but sometimes the characters develop as you do it. So, but I, I might not know all the ending. I might not know all the endings for every character mm -hmm. until I do it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, in your short story, uh, Swan Song. Oh yes. Um, you, you were saying you have to, the short story you have to get the essence of the plots and keep it in. You make references to the ex-wife and thought of one of the characters by coincidence living in the same hotel as the protagonist goes to, and it leaves a lot of, up to the imagination of the reader. Do you feel that that's a big part of writing like, short stories, putting in sort of clues? and the back history of the man working in the charity shop and his familiarity with the hotel. Do you think that's a big part of writing short stories, leaving clues for the readers? Yes, yes, I, I do. But um, that's an interesting example because that story was commissioned by the BBC and it was one of a series and it had to be on the theme of Heartbreak Hotel, the Elvis song. And there was there's a very specific number of words I think it's 2020 or something like that. So everything, you can't expand too much. So, but, but yes, I did want to leave it. I didn't want to do, or didn't have the space, but didn't want to do the backstories of everybody. And I think sometimes you don't need to. You know, you can just sketch it and, and as you say, leave it to the reader to supply. Um, you mentioned Heartbreak Hotel. In lots of your stories you bring to famous songs, um, music, um, what do you think uh, songs bring to the short story? Well, for me, it, it, um, I, don't, I mean, some, sometimes the story has had to be predicated on that. But I love to quote, and I love to quote poetry and song lyrics. Um, so I think, I think it does add to it. I think it like, adds colour and rhythm and all sorts of things. And also it can tell you about the characters too. But you can run into a lot of trouble because in um, Dancing on the Outskirts, um, I ran into huge copyright problems because people charge 
immense sums just for a line or a word or, or but we we managed to get round it um but it was it was very tricky do you want to read them from dancing on the outskirts yes sure I wasn't quite sure what to do this evening, whether to make it a complete Southampton evening. And then I have got a very short Southampton story I might read later if there's time. Or I thought, how, how far away from Southampton can I go? Because I've written about um, lots of my stories are set in different parts of the world. So I, I've chosen to read part of a story which is set in Goa. And... It is, of course, it's set in Go, but it's s seen not from a Goanese perspective, but from um, two visitors who've gone there, um, a woman who works in publishing and her assistant. <coughs> okay, this story is called The Day of the Gecko. And um, that's a sort of play on the title, The Night of the Iguana. I don't know if you know the, um, the play or the film. When the official part of the trip at the World Book Fair in Delhi was over, Alice and her assistant Natasha flew to Goa. The road from the airport wound downward to the sea through banyans, trailing creepers and banana trees, passing grazing cattle and marshes of small white water lilies standing erect on their stems. The taxi hit a bump, and in her mind's eye, Ali saw her, flu her suitcase flying from the boot, spilling books and business clothes, and submerging with the splash and scattering of stalks. She wondered if she would care if it did happen. After the heat and hassle of the city, the angst of travelling and hotel life, she could see how a person might be seduced by the surrounding lushness and enervated by the green humidity. Now and then they glimpsed houses with verandas and wooden balconies, breasting the foliage, pot-bellied pigs, black with pink stockings, rooting in the dust, goats and chickens, buffaloes. As each house was swallowed up behind them, Ali thought, her heartbeat quickening, Perhaps that's the one. Maybe that's where Eric Alabaster has gone to ground. And with a pang, she wondered if that woman carrying a bundle of reeds on her head might be Eric's wife, or if any of the school children there in their bright blue uniforms and flip-flops could be his. Eric Alabaster had published four novels between 1970 and 1985, and then he had disappeared. He had always been a reclusive, yet charismatic figure, a sun-bleached traveller. And when it became apparent that he had gone missing, several men claimed to be his closest friend, and various women declared that he had been in love with them. Alabaster had no family, except some cousins in Australia, with whom he hadn't kept in touch. For a while, it became common knowledge that Alabaster was an international arms dealer, a spy, a double agent working both for and against the government. Rumours of murder or suicide and speculation as to his whereabouts died down as the years passed, although his name still bobbed up like a cork from time to time in conversation and literary criticism. It was not until one of her authors had come forward with the idea of writing his biography that Ali read Alabaster's books and determined to relaunch them to coincide with the publication of The Life. Alicia Compton was the editorial director of a small publishing house which had been taken over by a large conglomerate. And for the time being at least, it seemed she had a free hand to develop her list. With apparent casualness, she made inquiries among Alabaster's former associates, which led her nowhere. And as far as his former publisher was concerned, the trail had gone cold in India. <clears throat> it had seemed to Ali, as she read the novels, that Alabaster was speaking directly to her. She was his first reader, the one for whom the books had been written. They were exactly the same age. 
She had gazed at the pictures on his book jackets until his lips almost moved in a smile. And then, as she planned her trip to Delhi, it was as if a bottle had been washed ashore at her feet, a bottle tossed into the Arabian Sea, containing the message that Eric Alabaster was waiting for her in Goa. It was the perfect place to disappear. And who knew what masterwork might have been penned beside that turquoise sea? With his white blonde hair and light eyes, he should not be hard to identify. Ali became aware of Tasha's conversation with the taxi driver. Why are you coming here, he was asking. You should go to North Go, where more tourists are going. That's why we came here. We don't want to be tourists. Actually, we're sort of looking for somebody. I think you're looking for me. Take it easy, Tasha, muttered Ali, regretting not for the first time that Tasha would be her companion in this earthly paradise. Tasha in India had proved quite a different person from the London Tasha. Or perhaps, having cast off her metropolitan black, she was showing her true colours. Ali's briefcase was full of the cards of publishers and academics, unsolicited manuscripts, and those of the two writers she had signed up, while Tasha's wallet bulged with the, scribbling, with the scribbled names and addresses of boys in carpet shops and hotel waiters. The cards of jewellers and the man from whom she'd bought her pashmina shawl. It would serve Tasha right if that mahout she had got so friendly with in Delhi turned up on her doorstep in Fulham with his elephant. Tasha Calloway was generally described as gamine. To Ali, her face was like a cat's, who rubs against your legs while knowing there is a dead bird behind the sofa. <laughs> Tasha had let her down badly in Delhi, taking off on a day's jaunt to the Taj Mahal, leaving Ali alone to, to cope with a portfolio of appointments. She had tossed Ali one of her postcards of the Taj, saying, you can send it to somebody, pretend you saw it herself, yourself. After all, everybody knows what it looks like. Now through the taxi window, Ali could see coconut palms soaring against the hot blue sky. There will be plenty more pebbles on the beach, she, show, she told Tasha, or fish in the sea. Will you answer me something? The driver asked. Why is it you people like to be naked on the beach? Before Tasha could reply, Ali said, No, you answer me something. How far is it to the De Silva guest house? We are there, Mama. The De Silva guest house was composed of the original structure where the family lived and five built-on apartments which faced the sea. A shrine to the Virgin was set into the front wall of the house and roses, hibiscus and jacaranda wreathed the veranda and wooden shutters. Each apartment was designed, was designed to take two people. But although Ali, enchanted by the guest house's careless perfection, said that she was willing to share, she was relieved when Tasha insisted that it, it would be better if they each had their own space. Ali was shown to number three, Tasha to number five. They saw a young couple disappearing into number four. Honeymooners, Tasha mouthed under the noise, the noise of the crows who strutted and flapped in the palm trees, cawing ceaselessly. As soon as they had dealt with the formalities, the women put on their swimming costumes under their clothes, slathered themselves in mosquito repellent and as low protection sun cream as they dared and headed for the beach. Mad dogs and English women, observed Tasha as they walked the short distance. They had seen several dogs already, pretty dogs with pricked ears, quite unlike the sad, scabby creatures that slunk about the city. Notices in their rooms had warned against wandering on deserted parts of the beach after sunset, particularly if they were scantily dressed, unless they were able to defend themselves. I've got a gecko in my cupboard, said Tasha. A gecko? It was a sign. The gecko was Ali's favourite among Ali Eric's books. Obviously, they had been given the wrong rooms. Ali had found only a striped frog swimming around her lavatory bowl, 
and scooped it out with a red plastic jug, which presumably had been supplied for the purpose. I'll swap rooms if you like, she offered, pulling Tasha past the man who had stepped out from his shop, a structure hung with carpets and fabrics and fronted by a rail of sun-faded garments. But I really need a sarong, Tasha protested, adding, no, it's okay, he's quite a sweet gecko, we've bonded. Thank you. <clears throat> I really like that story from this collection. Thank you. Yeah, in particular. Um, do you remember? I mean, we, the, the question of how you know something is a story. Do you remember like, how that story began, what the first glimmer of it might have been, and what you knew? I know sometimes it's hard to remember. Um, I don't. I, mean, I have been to Goa. So, I mean, all the description is things I remember from Goa. But the two characters and the, the lost right, I really don't remember how that came to me. Yeah. yeah. It was uh, such an interesting idea of this like, woman going after this writer in Goa and yes. the off deciding that's where he's disappeared to for mm. no particular reason. Mm. I really like the hallucinatory, hallucinatory section as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that it sort of goes into a hallucinatory bit. and. And it's, um, Ali gets a fever and she, her mind gets all jumbled up with the film, The Night of the Iguana. So that's, uh, yeah. so she's hallucinating, but you're not quite sure whether it's real or not. Mm -hmm. um, and it's unusual often for a um, story collection not to have the title from one of the stories in it. Yours is Dancing on the Outskirts. <laughs> How did yes. that come to be? Well, um, I don't know. Carol mentioned earlier um, a, an item on Woman's Hour with Lenny Goodings, who is, you probably know, um, publisher of Virago, one of the original founders of Virago, and who is now my publisher, talking about feminist writing. And um, I have now gone back to Virago as my publishers. And it was, in fact, Lenny who came up with, with the title Dancing on the Outskirts. Mm -hmm. because, and very, as you say, very often you, d you do take one of the, cause the atmospheric railway that is the title of one of the mm -hmm. stories, but we couldn't decide on which one to have. So we were playing around and with possible titles and Lenny came up with that. And yeah. And it seemed to have sort of echoes. It was quite, because I'm a very visual writer, it seemed to, be a very visual title and it had the suggestion of skirts and outskirts and mm -hmm. dancing so it just seemed to work and short stories often have outsiders in them somehow or people yes. on the outskirts and exactly yes yeah. yes yeah so i think it kind of works on several levels <laughs> yeah looking around quickly to remind you that you're able to ask questions as well um one thing I meant to say in my introduction is that um, Virago will be publishing several of your older works as Virago classics, which is yes, such an which honor. is which is lovely, yes. yeah, and which will um, I I imagine coincide with uh, you you're writing a memoir for yes. Virago as well. Well, I think I think what they're doing is phasing them in. So I think this year, possibly even April, they're going to publish the first two, um, Dunedin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a very confusing way. It's actually the old name for Edinburgh. And so the city of Dunedin in New Zealand was built as sort of mi mirror image of Edinburgh. And so the book set in Scotland and London and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So what were you saying? <laughs> and well, I was going to ask oh, yes, you about yes, the memoir. They were seeing Dunedin first and The Orchard on Fire. Uh -huh. So they should both be out quite soon. Exciting. Yeah. And, um, and you're working on a memoir as well. Yes. How is that different from writing fiction? How are you finding that? It's proving to be extremely difficult because um, I think when you start out as a writer and people ask you if your work's autobiographical, you say no, because you don't think it is. And that, um, the older you get, the more you realize that everything is autobiographical. So. I've in fact taken 
lots of, not characters specifically, but things and fictionalise them or places. So I've actually used quite a lot of my material is absorbed into the fiction. So I don't want to, I don't want to rewrite myself. Mm. So it is extremely difficult. Mm. And also, it you know, it takes you back down memory lane. So you're confronted all the time with memories. So it's psychologically, it's very difficult mm. and as well as physically. Mm. Right. Is it easier or hardier, hard, hardier, <coughs> easier or harder to work with sort of real things that have, have happened? Or do you prefer to simply invent them from air? Well, that's, that's what I mean. I mean, yes, lots of things one does completely invent from air and some things you don't. So. I don't know, it's both harder and easier. I mean, if, um, but you tend to get lost in, in memories and thinking about things. And, and I'm not one of these writers who believes that a, p a person, just because he or she is a writer, is entitled to take any material from the family, which could be somebody else's story, and just write it down and say, well, tough, I'm a writer. You know, a lot of writers have this attitude and there's that famous quotation about when a writer is born into a family, it's the end of that family. So, um, but I've, I've heard Colm Toybean defending that recently and all sorts of people, they mm. just say, well, tough. You know, I'm a writer. I have a right to cannibalise your story or your life. And, you know, I, th I think if there are things that people would rather you didn't write about, you have to be very careful. You don't have a divine right. And that's true with the memoir then as well. Yeah, no, no, I'm talking about yeah. the memoir actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So can I say, I mean, you came to prominence in a really fascinating time for English culture, you know, the, the, the early 60s. And, I mean, that is about to forget family things. I'd be fascinated <laughs> to read about, you know, your time in that, in that milieu and in, in, in that sort of culture, the other writers that, that you were friendly with who influenced you. That's what I would like to yeah, read about. Yeah, yeah. I am trying to do that as well. I mean, the way I'm doing it, it's not an autobiography. So I'm trying to just take, sort of, it's not random exactly, but, but various, various bits, so sort of disparate bits, discrete things. So yes, I am writing a little bit about that, that time. And, and so then of course, publishing has changed so much. Out of all recognition, yeah. yes. I mean, when I, I mean, my first book was published back in, I think it was 1964, and the publishing world was very, very different. I mean, they used to call it a gentleman's profession, and you know, it's famous for three-hour lunches, and there are many more independent publishers who had autonomy, and they had the power, they could take somebody on, nurture that person. They might think, well, this person isn't very good yet, but he or she is going to write something really good one day, so we'll nurse them along, which mm. publishers just can't now. So do you think that makes it harder now? I think it probably does make it harder. Mm. And also, also, I mean, it's a completely different world. I mean, so many people are publishing online and self-publishing. It's It just bears no resemblance, really. And, mm. I, thi and I, th I think writers starting out now have different expectations and they expect that they'll have to perform and read and go online and blog and do all sorts of things which didn't exist then. Which all take them away from writing. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Looking around the room for... Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the idea that the uh, semi-autobiographical stuff must come through in your writing because it's there, it's, it's a huge part of your life and it's got to come out. In my writing has been described as a travel log, a bit like Bill Bryson. Um, I hate the idea that I'm writing this sort of Bill Bryson type thing, but uh, is life like a travel log? Can you move away from the genre of a travel log? Because we're talking about your life, what's happened in it, and how you then it got to come into your writing. How, how, do you accept it might be a travel log through life? Oh, I'm trying to get away from the Bill Bryson idea of a mm. woman's story about myself, which is not just like, I went here and I did this and I met this and I met this. There'll be some more than that. 
So is your life a travelogue in that true sense of the word? Or do you bring in the characters and the, as you said, you bring in other characters to make it? Well, yes, I hope so, more, more than a travelogue. Um, because, I mean, what I'm trying to do is not an autobiography, so I don't have to do the travelogue route because I could just have a date. And this whole idea of the memoir it wasn't mine, but um, I was actually born on D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, and I was asked to write a piece for a newspaper about that. And so then the idea for doing something similar, you know, maybe taking a date or a period and just writing a bit about that came from, came out of that. Mm -hmm. So the travel life of history of your time. A historical travel log, yes. yes. <laughs> All in geography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tricky, tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some, sometimes I think I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. <laughs> but, but I've been very lucky and privileged. Um, I mean, it's a job I, I mean, I used to love doing it more than I do now, but I think, um, I mean, I've met wonderful people. I've been able to follow the profession that I wanted. So, and when writing's going well, I mean, it's great. It, it is hard work. I mean, it, I don't know, 60, 40, I don't know. <laughs> Would you recommend it? Yes, of course. It's wonderful. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You mentioned when you were in, that you'd been together. Yes. And you remembered things about the scenery. What, what do you do in terms of taking notes when you go to places? Was it entirely from memory or did you take notes when you were I think I, I, well, I remember I did, um, I did sort of make notes about those pigs which struck me a lot so I wrote down about the, the pigs because they had black bodies and pink stockings or the other <laughs> way around um, um, so yes but I mean just sort of observations of you know plants or trees um, you know not feelings or emotions or anything but just descriptions of you know the natural world which is, interests me a lot or, or birds or if I go somewhere I might write down a list of all the birds I've seen. So. Hmm. Do, do you keep notebooks like, like artists? Uh, well, I, I always take a notebook with me, yes, and just, just make jottings, yes. Yeah, I think it is important because you, you can forget things and something <coughs> that struck you very much at the time. So, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sometimes struck if I look at an old um, notebook that I'll remember something I'd completely forgotten and the entire scene will sort of come back to yeah. you, even if it's just a few yes, lines. Yes, yes. Yeah. I was curious to ask you about <coughs> endings in your short story and I particularly um, love the ending of Heron Cottage. Oh, yes. Which could almost be a beginning. Could it? <laughs> yeah. um, Yes, it could actually, it couldn't it? Yeah. it goes back. I don't, I don't know where about in the book it is, but yes, I, I'm glad you like that story because um, I mean, that was a story that just came out of nowhere. I, I just no, it didn't. Now, interesting point. No, it didn't because one of the one of the things that somebody sent me a postcard, and I thought that she had written wonderful cakes, <laughs> right? And I yes. thought. Um, and then when I, I looked again, I saw she'd actually written wonderful lakes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I used that in the story, but I don't know if that was the donny of the whole story. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the, I, d I don't know. I mean, that's pretty much from the imagination. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, unless someone has a question. Ah, there we go, yes. What, out of my... There, there are... I, d I have favourite sentences and endings. I'm very fond of a story called The Laughing Academy, which was the title story of another collection. 
um, I don't go back and look at my stuff very often, um, but sometimes I do, and I'm struck by something, a nice sentence. And also, this is another danger when you're as old as I am, that you can write a sentence, and then you'll go back and look at a book you wrote 20 years ago, and you've written exactly the same <laughs> sentence. <laughs> And each time you've thought, oh, that's good. Yes, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, but I'm, I mean, some silly little stories I'm quite fond of. I mean, this one isn't silly, but um, there's one called Ennui, which is based on a painting by Sickert, and I'm fond of that. And there's one, I mean, it's not silly, but I mean, it's kind of fantasy. It was a, a Christmas story written for the BBC called Nay, Ivy Nay. And I'm fond of that. So, I mean, the, rather than whole stories, I'm prob I probably like sentences and, and little bits of them or an image. Yeah. Yes, Joan. When you were reading out, uh, there were points where we laughed out loud, and, and I'm right with your stories that often there are sentences that just make me laugh out loud. Are there any readers, uh, sorry, are there any writers who you read who make you laugh out loud? Yes, absolutely, and I won't be able to think of any now, but because um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think there are enough funny writers now. Um, I mean, in, obviously, you, you know, you think of somebody like P.G. Woodhouse or... Um, but yes, there are. I mean, there, there's some lines in Nabokov that make me laugh out loud. For, um, in some of his stories. Um, I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but Kate it is... Moran? No. Kate no, I don't like her. <laughs> 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 she, she's the wrong generation for yeah, me. Yeah. And that awful <laughs> picture of her and those denim shorts over tights is yeah. not good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I know she's very popular, and I, I might be wrong, because I don't really read her much. Oh, I've never read her books, only her columns. No. I'm only throwing her name. <laughs> <laughs> what? A, but um, I mean, but who who does any? Can anyone, Joan, think of any contemporary writers? Or? Lynn Truss. Lynn Truss. Oh, she can. Yes, indeed, and on the radio. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and the the radio is very important to me. Always has been, all my life. I mean. The, the BBC, it's, I mean, it's, it can educate you. And, I mean, I heard Samuel Beckett's first play, All That Fall, when I was a child on the radio. It's brought such riches throughout my life. What about other writers who've been influential to you or who you simply enjoy? Um, it's, it's really hard to say influential. I mean, are we talking about Contemporary writers. Mm. Um, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about this last no, week, didn't no. we? Um, I mean, yes, obviously, lo lots of people. Um, <laughs> and you mentioned a writer who you um, recently discovered. The Australian writer? Oh, yes, yes, a wonderful Australian writer called Elizabeth Harrower. I don't know if anyone else knows her. And she's about 90, if somebody does, good. Um, or possibly <laughs> over 90. And she's, only, she's been, I suppose, well known in Australia or known to some people for a long time. But in this country, people have just started discovering her. And. Um, what was it called? That, um, the one uh, with the tower in the title, the Tower of, of Something Tower, which I think is her masterpiece. And she's written other things as well. I think it was just called The Tower or something. No, I think it, because I, th I was trying to remember it the other day when I was talking to Carol, and I could think of The Tower, and then when I got home, it, it's, so there's another word beginning with T in there somewhere, but anyway. Elizabeth Harrow is absolutely wonderful. Um, 
deep psychological insight and this book with Tara in the title is a real page turner. It's a sort of psychological thing. I mean, if you're following the story of Rob and Helen in the Archers, um, <laughs> this, is, this is actually worse. I mean, it's so tense and awful. I was thinking, I don't know how long that shorter story is, but do you want to end with that? Oh, yes, yes, That would could. be a really lovely <coughs> way to end. This is just a little story that, um, it's not in any of the collections that I wrote for a magazine. This is called Now Showing at the Rivoli, and I had an alternative title for it, which was Celia in Thunderland, because, um, the girl's name is Alice, and it's actually an anagram of Celia. I mean, the girl's name is Celia, which is an anagram of Alice. Now showing at the Rivoli. The bride was in bits, the bridesmaids in pieces on the floor. A little bridesmaid had kicked off her white patent shoes and lay face down on the carpet in a silent tantrum. The groom, dressed in his winter white wedding suit, with cranberry-coloured cravat and cummerbund, his acrylic wig askew, looked on, glassy-eyed. On a November afternoon, as, as dismal as the tableau in the window of Bows and Bell's wedding boutique, two students, on their way to buy fireworks, stopped to stare at the wreckage of the wedding display. At half past three, the high street seemed defeated by the day and had an air of shutting down. Far from home, in a, in a parade of dreary shops in a strange city, the girl and boy stood under their shared umbrella, which made a smudge of red in the drizzle. Hilarious, said the boy, letting go of the umbrella and taking a selfie against the scene of disembodied limbs and smiling heads. The scattered bouquets and the champagne bottle which had rolled up against an unravelling bolt of scarlet silk. Come on, Celia, this will be really cool, perfect for our wedding invitations. He tried to get her into the picture, but she moved away. She had seen the padlock on the shop door and the post pooling under the letterbox. She shivered in the mean wind, blowing through the thin sleeves of her jumper. Everything's so cool to you, Lennox. These are people's broken dreams that you find so hilarious. I'm going to the Salvation Army shop to look for a coat. I'll catch you up at Nobby's Novelties. There was to be a bonfire party that evening in their shared student house, and Nobby's, one of the shops on the parade, was the only place where you could buy fireworks. As Celia walked away, she heard a distant fut and boom of a firework and saw a starburst in the sky. She twisted the ring on her finger. It was a moonstone in a sliver of gold, placed there by Lennox at the end of their second year at university. Now he would think that she dreamed of a white wedding with all the faux swans down trimmings, when the truth was she didn't know if she wanted to marry him or anybody else at all. His heartless idea for their wedding invitation filled her with embarrassment and despair. Celia was a third year history, history student who could see nothing in the future to feel optimistic about. I want my mum, she thought, and homesickness engulfed her as she looked down the bleak vista at strangers waiting at the bus stop, the pawn shop, the nail parlour, the boarded up cinema, which, since its glory days, had been a bingo hall and then a charismatic church. The building bore traces of all its incarnations, and if you looked up, you could just make out Rivoli in faded letters on its facade. As soon as she saw the coat on the vintage rack in the charity shop, she knew it was the one. It was in a cherry-coloured ribbed fabric, fitted with big buttons and a full skirt, still flaunting a bit of glamour and swagger. She slipped it on. It felt like coming home. To some it might have looked incongruous over her skinny jeans, but to Celia it was perfect. As she was leaving the shop, 
She put her hands in the pockets and felt a hole in the lining of one. She fumbled down to the hem and drew out a coin, a silver sixpence dated 1955. <coughs> Studying it as she walked to the curb to cross, she tripped on an uneven paving stone and felt herself falling. You all right, miss? A boy with a freckled, friendly face was helping her to her feet. Yes, thanks, I'm fine. Okie doke, he mounted a bicycle and was gone. The grey sky had changed to a smoky cobalt blue, tinged with frost and streaked with exploding yellow, red and green. Celia walked on as if in a dream. Where she expected to see a supermarket, there was a toy shop and a chemist's with huge glass bottles filled with magical coloured elixirs. And this shop window, displaying wool and knitting patterns, presided over by a kindly sheep. Wasn't it where Nobby, Nobby's novelties should be? Who were these people chatting cheerfully at the bus stop? Where was this enticing scent of grinding coffee beans coming from? Passing a greengrocer's, wasn't that where the betting shop used to be? She was halted by a purple, earthy smell and looking inside, saw a bucket of beetroot steaming between the boxes of vegetables and bright cut flowers. Weirder and weirder, thought Celia, holding the silver sixpence in her hand. She found herself outside the old cinema. To her astonishment, the name Rivoli was flashing in red neon letters. She walked through the double glass doors into the peachy light of an art deco palace of chrome and mirrors where the walls were hung with portraits of movie stars. Posters advertised the Hollywood musical that was showing now. A grand staircase curved in front of her and Celia climbed its carpeted steps. Up she went, past the auditorium, to the top floor where she came to a restaurant. Pushing open the door, she entered a warm atmosphere of tea and toasted tea cakes and cigarette smoke, chatter and the clink of china. Celia sat down at a table with a white cloth. I must get back, she thought. Lennox will be waiting. We've got to get the fireworks. A smiling middle-aged lady, comfortably cheerful in her black dress with a frilled white apron and cap, was approaching to take her order. Cheer up, duck, she said. It might never happen. <laughs> Thank you much, so much, Sheena Mackay. That was uh, really wonderful. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Nafield Theatre for hosting us again. Um, remind you that um, Ian from October Books has many, many, many of um, Sheena's <laughs> books for her to you to purchase and for her to sign. Um, and a reminder that the last uh, Writers in Conversation of the year, academic year, um, will be April 25th with um, our own Adam Brace, who's also the playwright in residence at the Nuffield. He is not going to be reading. We're going to have a staged reading with actors of a play that he's been working on that comes out of the research in the English department. It's called The Teasers. Um, I apologize to the third years that this is the day before your dissertations are due. It was the only possible date we could gather all the people, but you should all be done by then anyway. So um, anyways, um, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you, could, Sheena. Could I just say thank you very much, Carol, for your lovely chair. Oh, thank you. And thank you to the Nuffield. And thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Thanks. again. Bye.